Hi, I'm Dr. Shanda Blackman, Associate Professor of Surgery at Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas with Cornell. And I'm here to talk to you with all of these other gentlemen about lung cancer screening. And we'll start by introducing ourselves and then we'll go through some questions about lung cancer screening. I'm Dan Boffa. I'm a thoracic surgeon at uh, Yale University. I'm Farood Farja. I'm a thoracic surgeon at the University of Washington in Seattle. I'm Gaetano Rocco. I'm a thoracic surgeon at the National Cancer Institute of Naples, Italy. So let's start with Dr. Baffa. How do you think that the public will start to see changes in their health care with the implementation of lung cancer screening? So I think that the that will ultimately translate into the coverage uh, by insurance carriers for the CT scanning program. I think there are this raises as many questions as it does <coughs> answer as the 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 national uh, lung screen uh, lung cancer screening trial um, I think showed that a process was associated with the reduction in mortality not just a CT scan and I think the the real uh, question is the extent to which that can be replicated in the general public or are people just going to be getting uh, CT scans and not the process which ended up being so successful Right, because I think the true benefit of lung cancer screening comes from the second and third year follow-up of cancer screening, not just that initial screen. Dr. Rocco, do you want to tell us a little bit about your advocacy paper that you wrote summarizing what's been achieved with lung cancer screening in STS? Yes. The, um, uh, this paper was the uh, product of a uh, co collaborative effort uh, within the STS uh, uh, general thoracic surgical workforce. And um, it was meant to provide some uh, very ground rules uh, and recommendations as to how the surgeon should be, <clears throat> should be um, uh, involved early in the process of lung cancer screening trials and programs. Um, <coughs> the idea is that um, the, uh, there was a, a much uh, uh, sought for emphasis on the uh, need for uh, board certified thoracic surgeons to be involved with uh, uh, special skills, especially in uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, uh, surgery, which uh, is the only uh, way that uh, we perceive uh, we can reduce the morbidity and uh, the, uh, uh, we can be more accurate in our diagnosis because of the issue of false positive, and I think we're going to come back on that. Yeah, I think there's a real focus on making sure that just because nodules get diagnosed that people don't have too much surgery performed and that those benign nodules are followed and that they don't all end up having surgery, causing more morbidity. Tell us a little bit about who should be screened. Yeah, so um, in general, high-risk patients should be screened, uh, but of course what constitutes high-risk varies depending on who you ask. So the most evidence-based approach would be to look at the inclusion criteria for the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial. Um, but there are many who believe that those inclusion criteria are too narrow. And in fact, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons put out a response to the United States Services, uh, Preventive Services Task Force um, explaining that point of view. And they've, in fact, expanded their indications for lung cancer screening, as have other entities. So. Um, the, I think the take-home message is high-risk patients only should be screened, and there are uh, a handful of practice guidelines that can uh, provide guidance on how to select those patients. Yeah, so the NLST trial said anyone who's older than 55 has a 30-year pack year smoking history and who hasn't had a recent CT scan should probably be screened, and they had to have quit within 20 years. And we do think a lot of that is a little bit too narrow because there are patients who've had lung cancer and they're at high risk for another tumor, and after they're coming out of surveillance, I think most thoracic surgeons think they should be screened too. Do you? For surveillance after lung cancer surgery, yes. And, and for that, in particular, we follow the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, uh, which is uh, CT scanning every six months for the first two years and then evolving to CT scans yearly thereafter. And then what do you do when they're done with that five-year follow-up? Do you put them back in a CT screening program? Um, at that point, it would be individualized and it would again relate to their risk right. so hopefully we would have succeeded in uh, getting them to stop smoking which the majority of patients are doing um, but if we haven't and they have other risk factors they very well may remain eligible 
for further surveillance and screening. So I think this group was selected because we all run lung cancer screening programs. Why don't we start to go around the table and talk about everyone's screening program and see how each one may be unique, especially I'm curious about how it works in Europe. Do you want to start, yeah. Dr. Rucker? Yeah, the, uh, um, the issue we have in Europe that so far we haven't had uh, studies powered as much as the uh, NSLT. Uh, NLT. Um, the, uh, uh, the other issue we have is that uh, obviously uh, the um, uh, epidemiological scenarios are different in different countries. Um, so we have multiple uh, randomized trials. And the, um, the uh, uh, attention we are uh, uh, paying on the trials and the programs, uh, future programs, is the attention to costs. And one way is to, uh, uh, as I was say, uh, saying before, to minimize the false positive rates. And uh, in, in this uh, context, I'd like to um, mention that, uh, especially in Italy, there is now a, um, a trial um, that's been uh, uh, concluded and uh, uh, that showed that uh, the uh, uh, combination of a uh, uh, low density uh, CT scan and microRNA signature in a plasma based uh, of uh, over uh, 900 patients can actually uh, create the, the, the uh, scenario by which from you, you can have a, a five-fold decrease in the false positive rate from uh, uh, pretty much 27% to 3.7%. So uh, that was um, published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology this month. So uh, this is a, a trial that we've been uh, helping with in a, uh, as a, we have a, we, what we call the dorsal oncological uh, structure in Italy uh, with uh, all the National Cancer Institutes, but it was led by Dr. Pastorin and colleagues from Milan. Nice. So it sounds like we have a lot of new tools that are coming down the Absolutely. pipeline to help us figure out what to do with those positive screens and, yeah. again, stop over intervening on patients who have lung nodules that are benign. Correct. How does your program work? So we have a, a lung cancer early detection and prevention clinic, and it's uh, it was designed and it's um, it, it's collaborative, but it was it was incepted by a pulmonologist who we have a very good relationship with. And patients come once a week to see the pulmonologist in clinic, um, but the morning before we have very much um, uh, a collection of pulmonologists, thoracic surgeons, and thoracic radiation or radiologists that review. The clinical history and the image is much like a tumor board. Um, we also have uh, smoking cessation counselors um, who see the patients and emphasize that as well. The patients who come to our clinic are coming to get uh, advice about screening, have a positive result from screening, or have incidentally detected lung nodules. So we come up with a plan for not only their diagnosis, but their staging with an eye towards being a guideline adherent. Um, safe and efficient. Um, and so it's worked out really well, um, and uh, um, um, everyone seems to be happy. It's a good working relationship. It sounds like a comprehensive program that's multidisciplinary. Yes. Exactly what you want to see in a lung cancer screening program. That's excellent. Dr. Vatha? So I think uh, ours is, uh, at Yale, is, is similar. I think that um, one phase that we recently uh, implemented was offering free scans to a limited number of people. And I think that uh, we had a concentrated event where patients were first uh, counseled as to the risks of lung cancer and the implications of a, of a scan, and then underwent a CT scan and then were counseled uh, afterwards. And I think that um, and again, the, the scans that show findings are reviewed uh, at a multidisciplinary nodule conference. And I think that, and you just can't emphasize enough that for, for uh, the CT scan program, for a nodule program to work, uh, you have to be able to approximate what happened in the ASLT, which was basically 28% <coughs> of people will have a nodule, but the number of people that actually undergo any intervention is... Uh, on the order of 4%. And so there, there has to be either through a, a blood-based test or as the NSLT clinical judgment of the people involved. Um, you know, I think with the, I'm not even gonna try the acronym again, but with the, uh, with the US Preventative Medicine Task Force passage of uh, approving 
uh, screening CT scan. I, I think there were a couple of interesting things about that that relate to the, uh, the eligible uh, patients. And they did a lot of interesting modeling uh, to, to determine how long people should be screened for. And I think that um, that takes the NSLT to another level. And I think they, they actually found that unlike the NSLT, which cut off at 74 eight, uh, years of age, they took it to 80 years of age. But once you've gotten to the point that you have not smoked for 15 years, uh, that uh, you are to stop getting CT scans. And I think that that's where, where most practitioners are going to become less clear is you have patient year after year with a negative scan. When do you stop scanning? And I think that, number one, uh, that gives us a ceiling of, of when to cut things off. But it also... Um, uh, gives us a threshold. If you have an, an active smoking cessation program, hopefully between the ages of 55 and 80, these people will stop smoking. Another clarification that they made that I think is, is important but ambiguous is to say that screening is good for people who uh, don't have a lot of other medical problems that are uh, competing risks to their survival. And mm -hmm. that screening somebody, they, I think they, the, the, exact language they use uh, refers to their uh, ability to undergo surgery. And I think, I'm not sure that's the right way to package that, but the concept that screening should be limited to healthier people uh, that aren't going to have their life shortened by another process, I think, is, a, is a, an important one. Um, so I think that we've, we are trying to uh, take into consideration their recommendations and modify uh, and, and adapt who should be in the screening program. I think that's interesting, and I think that's one of the reasons why people do have a top age cutoff in their screening program. If you have an 80-year-old patient who's not going to want to have anything done, if they're diagnosed with lung cancer, there's no point in screening them. However, some 80-year-olds act like 60-year-olds and are quite healthy and should have screening because they would like to have an intervention. And so I think keeping the terminal end of when you screen people at what age leaving it a little bit open is, is good, leaving it up to the clinical judgment of the physician. I, I think to the, to the point uh, of, of as patients go year after year with a negative CT scan, the temptation may be to say that's a person that we should back off the scanning or widen the interval. But I think an important uh, fact is we're not looking for indolent cancers. We're looking for dangerous cancers. And unfortunately, you're only going to find dangerous cancers if you look regularly. And so if we widen the interval, we're going to find more indolent cancers. We're not going to find more aggressive cancers early, which the NSLT really, uh, when you distill it down, I think found less stage four cancers, more aggressive cancers. And that's where the reduction in mortality was, not by finding more stage one cancers, uh, because many of them were probably uh, not likely to impact survival. Right. So a lot of people are concerned about the impact of screening and radiation. Is anyone familiar with the amount of radiation that you get from a low-dose CT scan and what that means to a patient? I think it's about, well, I'm sorry. I think it's about 1.5 millisieverts, yeah. and a traditional right. scan is around 7. I mean, <coughs> I, I uh, you know, the, I don't know how comfortable I am with the association with radiation and secondary malignancies. I think there definitely is an association there. Um, I think that it is unclear how the, uh, the dosimetry, meaning how scans that are spread out by 12 months, um, how that's going to translate into cancers. I think it's difficult to compare that to other radiation exposures and expect to translate that into a cancer risk. So I think it's a very important consideration, but I think there's a lot that's still to be determined about that. And I think it's uh, in, uh, in this setting, um, the refinement on the, of the old process, uh, you know, the reduction of false positive, the, the, uh, 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 the creation of new thresholds for size, um, the epidemiological scenarios will all have an impact in reducing the amount of radiation and, and CT scan so that we can refine the process and really select the high-risk group and the how many uh, times they have to be scanned. Right. Yeah. 
I think one of our concerns is tracking the amount of radiation that patients get, especially if they have a nodule that's diagnosed and then we follow up on that nodule. And I've noticed, I don't know if, if, if you have noticed, but I've noticed that a lot of insurance companies are starting to track how much radiation their patients are getting. And sometimes when we order surveillance films, they're calling us, asking us, are we sure we want to go above a certain amount of radiation for the patient, which is a great tool for patients. Does anyone want to talk a little bit about how STS worked to get lung cancer screening passed through Kathleen Sebelius and to make it as an advocacy issue with patients? So I know the health policy workforce worked very hard with the STS PAC to, to advocate on behalf of our patients to make sure that this was a key issue with Congress and finally led to action. So we're actually quite pleased that your paper gave so much information to Congress to follow up and realize how important the issue was. And I think it was quickly after the publication of your paper that we were able to see a big change. Okay. So that's Thank very you. exciting. Thank, Thank you. you for all that work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not sure if the Political Action Committee is a co-sponsor of this event, but I, I would put a pitch in for them because I do, I, I, uh, I do think that there is uh, the the legislators are surprisingly accessible and I think responsive uh, to medical issues. And I think this is a great example of, uh, of clinicians lobbying for their patients and enacting meaningful change. And I think a lot of people uh, assume that government is an unwieldy, uh, unaccessible entity, but um, I do think it's our responsibility to uh, step up and take action. And this is one example where uh, the, the results are, are going to be game-changing for a lot of, uh, of smokers in the United States. So essentially all the work that STS and its workers have done in cooperation with surgeons in the PAC have led to absolutely a change. And with the implementation of lung cancer screening, we expect to see about a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality. We'd like to thank you for sitting here with us. Have a great day.